always crosses people's minds in our office. When you're filming, do people question when there's a camera crew? I think there's just some of the mechanics of making the film that we know how things work generally. And I'm just curious how you had to work in certain situations to avoid drawing too much attention. Did you want to draw attention? Talk us through that a little. Okay, so it totally depends on every action. Um, some actions you actually want camera crews to be there that look like real camera crews. So we actually use really big cameras or we try and get a hold of a big camera. And if the cameraman shows up in his dress too hip, we have to be like, no, go put on the khaki. So we want those guys to look like burly news journalist guys. So it looks like legit press is coming to the event. Because if we show up with the tiny HD cameras that we normally shoot with, it doesn't look like real press is covering the event. And then sometimes we may need to make it look like there's not press there, so then we're using super small cameras or hidden cameras. So it just totally depends. But every shoot is a little bit different and has to be planned for accordingly. And um, from time to time, Andy and Mike, do you guys shoot? Yeah. You're, yeah. I mean, a lot. Yeah. Like, I mean, yeah, I mean, yeah. most of the actions in the film we, we shot uh, before we began the movie, or maybe three of the actions. Do it a little less professionally, but... Still effective. Yeah. Still effective. But I think I'm just going to switch gears and go to you guys for a minute, and then I'll open it up straight away. Because the other thing, I think traditionally, for people who've read our brochure, a lot of times when we look at your films at Human Rights Watch, it's sort of about business and human rights and corporations. But I was just going to share, because I was sharing this with Laura, this week at Human Rights Watch, we actually put out a report. I wrote down the title, because I kind of can't process it myself. We put out a report called Mary Before Your House is Swept Away. And what this report is about, you can go to our website, hrw.org, and read it. It's about child marriage in Bangladesh. Very common that young girls are married off 10, 12, 14, all under 18. But one of the main reasons people marry off their daughters is because they are living in areas that are susceptible to tsunamis and other natural disasters. And so it's a very common thing if you live in an environment and you don't have enough means, wealth, to move away from a dangerous area, you would marry off your daughter. And basically there's a whole discourse around climate change driving child marriage. Okay, so that was a long story. I'm getting to the question. In the film, I too lived through the hurricane, and I live on the 10th floor, not the 19th floor, but I stayed downtown during the blackout. And I think the conversation you guys have in that scene for me personally, is very compelling, um, kind of questioning yourselves and where you are and your activism and your life. And I don't know, I, would you be willing to elaborate on that a little bit? I don't know, for me, that's very compelling. I hope you would share more, maybe. Yeah, sure, you mean our hypocrisy? Part? Yes, I'm middle-aged, I don't know, how, I don't know. However you want to frame it, do you still see it as hypocrisy? Of course, yeah. I mean, well, it, it's really hard as a consumer of a limited number of options to really make ethical choices. I mean, what is the ethical gas to buy at the station? Is it <laughs> ethical pizza to buy, you know, from what? Like, what composes things? You don't know. Um, you have to be super careful if you're going to actually not damage things with your choices. Which is why, cons like, depending on consumers to make the right choices, which is the default the go to, is nonsense. And we really have to, like, actually go to the source of production and bring in corporations and make different laws. Um, the stress on, like, consumer choice as the driver of, of, of justice is, is really convenient to big corporations. I'm glad you brought that up, Andy because uh, we have this email list that I, I want to circulate. Good segue. And uh, yeah, it's the perfect segue for this email list because this is all about resisting those sorts of pressures. And um, we have this new platform that you see at the, at the very end of the film for just a second, mm -hmm. the Action Switchboard, where people can sign up to meet each other. It's a bit like if you mashed up Tinder, a dating website with Kickstarter, <laughs> and some kind of you know, sharing, skill sharing website. And the idea is to put people, connect people together to do these creative direct action projects, or just, you know, uncreative direct action projects, but direct action projects that are effective. So um, if, you, if you sign up, we will not only um, put you in that database of people, you'll get an email back. You'll still have the option to fully opt in, 
Um, either we'll just send you occasional propaganda about what we're doing, or you will opt in and describe your skill set, where you live, things like that, that would allow us to then connect you to other people and work together um, to fight against exactly what uh, Andy was just describing. Precisely that. <laughs> and, and there's also an eight-week uh, online workshop that's beginning in July where you can actually go through the whole process of coming up with an action and so on. There are also pencils, um, if anybody doesn't have one, I mean, you pass around the pen, but we'll pass uh, around the, pen. the Invisible Boyfriend uh, Jameson, that's Patrick in the back, who was actually my boyfriend for most of the film, <laughs> but was not in the film, uh, has a box of pencils. Thank you, James. I don't know, pass them around. Wait, yeah, and do you guys have some flyers? Is, is, do you have a piece, anything to pick up for people? Just oh. talking about it? Yeah, do we have the flyers in the theater? Because I know that they were outside, but it'd be great. And that, that's the program that he just, uh, just talked about is called The Incubator. And um, if people are interested in getting involved, you can sign up for the incubator, and that helps you get on the switchboard. It's the same thing, yeah. And they're both the same thing. Okay, and we'll say that again at the end. But now let's take your questions. We've held you off long enough, so <laughs> I'd love to... I see a hand in the back, and I see on the side. So we'll go here, and we'll come to the side. Let's go right ahead. Yeah, how on earth, after all these years, do people not recognize you? It's the wig. <laughs> what did you say? The wig. Oh, the wig. It's the wig. Actually, that wig, there's a strange backstory there. That wig was apparently made, is, is the wig maker in the room? The wig maker? It's apparently RuPaul's wig maker. <clears throat> Somebody close to us was connected to RuPaul's wig maker, but RuPaul's wig maker apparently was very busy and so could only do the wig at about five in the morning after a very late show, drag show. of some kind, drag show. And so we got the wig at 7 a.m. before leaving at 7.15. Nobody had opened the box, nobody looked at the wig. <laughs> the wig came out in the car, and so it was a pretty special moment. I hadn't seen the wig. I hadn't seen the wig until Andy walked in that day. And it was kind of, yeah, my heart kind of, <laughs> well, it didn't stop. I'm still here, but I had a moment. I had a moment. I thought it was. I thought, yeah, I thought it was over because of a wig, which it's you know it turns out you can yeah people don't recognize you in those contexts anyway, and even if they do, they might bust into the room and do something dramatic, which is good for film because the best scene in the film, I think, is the chamber of commerce scene where the real chamber of commerce guy comes into the room. And so, you know, being recognized is not necessarily a detriment. It can help. Where is the wig now? <laughs> no idea. No? Where's the jacket? <laughs> also don't know. <laughs> this might be an action to find these. Okay, so yes, you had your hand up over here, and I'll come back over here. I see you guys. Uh, your film does a beautiful job of dramatizing the cycles of hope and hopelessness that, that I think a lot of people in the activist community feel and even just onlookers over the last couple of decades, boom and bust really quickly. Um, how do you, what do you think the role of long-termness is in all of this, and how do you deal with that? Um, yeah, I mean, that's actually the reason we made the film. One of the reasons we made the film the way it is, with the personal story and so on, uh, was to communicate that, that the, the source of hope is the long-termness. Um, and, you know, any action, you, you see us kind of despair over failures. Um, but with Occupy, when Occupy sprang up, a lot of people actually came up and told us that they had seen one of our previous movies and that that had either gotten them started in activism or had somehow been important to them. And, and that really is sort of the, a turning point, and it, I hope it comes across that that is like the source of hope and the source of why you do these things. It's not that each action or protest is gonna succeed. I mean, almost none of them will, but long-term <laughs> movements do succeed. And, you know, civil rights, abolition, gay rights, uh, women's suffrage, and so, I mean, they all win um, as long as people keep at it for long enough. And th I think that's what we're in the middle of right now, and it's not sure when it started. Maybe it was with the Zapatistas declaring war on the Mexican state, 
Um, it seems to all be part of the same thing, including Black Lives Matter, which is also about inequality. Um, and it's going to win. It just is such an immense problem that it's really hard to know when. Um, but it will win. You can, whoever can go first. Um, so I know that you were also, as part of the question about the identity thing, I know that you all were also targeted by Stratford, and there's a whole thing with coming out by the fact that they were despised or going after you with the private ties or whatever. Um, I think that's also kind of hilarious given that you clearly are the same people each time in the videos, and yet they weren't able to stop you. Um, so what, what was the choice about not including that part? Do so people in the back here question? Okay. So, do you guys mind repeating? I'll just hand this over. No, no. It's uh, so the the question was why he was saying that um, the yes men were spied upon by Stratford, which is a corporate spy agency, um, and why we didn't include that scene. In the so um, it was a really hard decision, and that was probably the scene that was the hardest to lose, and one that had the most debate. Vigorous debate, but um, it was tough to be able to keep it because it's actually a fairly involved scene. It's fairly complex, and it didn't advance the climate story very directly, nor did it advance the personal story very directly. So it was very hard to make it fit into the structure. But we're going to be releasing it separately very soon um, on Vimeo. So for those of you that are interested in that, it'll be cool to see and. There's actually going to be a Q&A with Julian Assange on Sunday here at the 240 show um, if you want to hear Julian and Yasmin talk about that more. And, and we are going to release a 20 minute or so piece. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, what she said. <laughs> I, I thank you for your question. These are always hard to repeat, but I'm going to do my best. Just this viewer was sharing, <clears throat> excuse me, sort of about how, like, she loves how insane you guys are and all the actions. But one of the things that's a little bit sad, I'll use your word, or like heartfelt, is how you talk about your personal lives and how activism does tend to take a toll on one's personal life. And, you know, would you be willing to talk about that? And how does your family feel? And, you know, it's a reality of being an activist. And, yeah, I mean, it's also reality of being like a, you know, working in a high power position in most corporations. <laughs> you know, people are asked to work insane hours. It's, I, I, I don't know, like, I feel like it's not necessarily a disease of activism. Um, although, yeah, it takes, a, 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 in my case, a pretty big toll. And I think um, it, it's very hard to balance it. I also, you know, work, I live here, but I work in Troy, which is two and a half hours away. I spend about eight hours a week in transit, you know, just back and forth to up there and back here. And I mean, I don't go every day, but all these things end up, you know, making for a kind of schizophrenic, uh, I mean, you know, several, uh, the identities actually play out in, in several different places. And that's, it's a challenge, but you know, I, I don't know. I mean, if I, if I think about what, um, uh, you know, some of these uh, stockbrokers must have to do. It, it seems, you know, they have a very hard life. Yeah. I mean, all that coke and stuff that they so have to okay. do in addition. <laughs> but, I, but I think it's also, you know, a reflection of what it's like to live right now in the U.S., where right. many people have multiple jobs, and if you work in anything that's outside a kind of like capitalist model, you have to do it on your own free time. So that's true if you're involved in the arts or if that's true if you're involved in anything passionately that is not able to sustain your family or if the job that you have doesn't sustain your family. So um, I think it just speaks to the kind of over commitment that many people share. And it's not supposed to be about how sad it is. It's supposed to be about how exciting Occupy was to see that all of it was worth it. You know, all the sacrifices were worth it because it somehow, indirectly and weirdly, 
fed into this movement which erupted and got us all talking about inequality and has continued. So, um, yeah. And it was pretty exciting to be on the, the streets in September, you know, for the climate march, the People's Climate March, which um, I think we're going to see more than a million people in Paris in uh, December 2015. And I think that that's going to be a really exciting destination, a watershed moment for the, the climate movement. So, um, yeah, it's a good time to actually be optimistic, get involved. And um, this brings me to another thing, since we're so tired and pathetic, um, we need help, clearly. And so um, one of the things we need help doing is promoting the film because we don't have an advertising budget. And so if you guys can tell people to come see the film here, especially this weekend, you know, we have all these matinees and they spend all this money air conditioning this place. It's really hot out there, so you can at least tell people that they can cool down for a little while, you know, and enjoy a climate-controlled environment and a movie. Um, and, you know, instead of going and seeing Mad Max for the third time, which I highly recommend, um, you could come here and see this movie for the first time. Um, so, yeah, it, but, but we really do rely on you to get the word out, because, uh, so you're all hired, we just can't pay very much. Why don't you take a moment now to have everybody tweet? Right this minute. Oh, wow, I never <laughs> thought of that. How do we do it? I don't know how to tweet. I know that. What's your handle? Yeah. Uh, right, so, no, so, 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 so our, 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 our yes handle men. is at the yes men, the yes men. So if you want to and tweet that, that would be fantastic. And our website is the yes men are revolting .com. If you go to watch the film, all the screenings are listed. At IFC Thank you so much. And That's at amazing. IFC Center. At IFC but we're also opening up and select cities around the country, so you also might know of people who live in other places in the United States of America who might want to go see the film. Could you repeat it? Because it's at, a to get more. Yeah, <laughs> at the Yes Men. So not at Yes Men, but at the Yes Men. What do we say? <laughs> <laughs> the movie's fabulous and you should go see it. I, I'm sitting in the theater and I'm blown away. That's what you should say. <laughs> Yes. 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 Because the film is about aging as a radical, you know, and as a almost like a comic, a clown, you know, the prankster. But I want to know how you deal with process failure. You know, you, when when you do this kind of work, and people distance themselves from it, or uh, it fails. You know, you must have had some failures along the way. And how you, I mean, this, anyone who gets to be the age that some of us are in this room who have been activists know that sometimes despair does come into for a moment, maybe not to you two guys, but I just wondered how you process failure to find the way to get to the next prank. I'm going to summarize. I, I won't do it justice. I'm going to try. Like I said, just this gentleman was sharing the sentiment that in the movie, obviously, we process somewhat in a prankster-like way, being an activist and dealing with failure, but sort of a serious question about how do you process failure and sort of use that to get to the next prank or the next level. Like, it's a process we all go through. Can you speak to that a little bit as someone who's been doing this for a while? Well, I mean, in a way, all actions fail. Like, they almost never achieve what they set out to achieve. Like... You know, there's an occasional example like Tim to Christopher. Long, if you Google Tim to Christopher, amazing story. Or, you know, uh, the taking over of the Serbian Parliament and getting rid of Milosevic. But there's very few protests or actions that actually succeed by themselves. But cumulatively, as part of movements, they all succeed. As I was saying before, you know. So you just remember that you're part of something much bigger than yourself, and that what you do, if it's visible and meaningful, and you know, affects people and isn't just a consumer choice, 
um, will feed into a movement that will win. So it's not a failure. Mm -hmm. Like ACT UP, you know, did any of those actions actually force the pharmaceutical companies to get down to research and, you know, force the administration to fund them? No, none of the actions individually, but cumulatively they did. Mm -hmm. So they won, you know, but there wasn't any individual action that did that. Well, the CBS News action was pretty... Yeah, I mean, they were all, you know, they all <laughs> played a part. They were spectacular, but they didn't individually do it. So the failures were constant, and the success was cumulative, something like that. Long view. Long term. So we have time for a couple more questions in here, and I think the flyers got passed around, too, if I'm not mistaken, which we'll touch on before we get there. See your hand, and I see your hand. So please go ahead. I'm just wondering, um, you're both teaching now, and what is it that teach. That's easy for me. I'm not teaching. I was teaching for four years at NYU, but it was a visiting job, so I'm not. What are you teaching? Um, I'm on summer holiday. Nothing. Uh, <laughs> no, I, right now I teach uh, I teach some video courses, a uh, course that I called Hacktivism, which is sort of hacktivism, sort of not, and then an inflatable sculpture course. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> it's just we eat, we make food, we eat, we make fires, we burn things, we uh, tap trees and drink the blood, that kind of thing. <laughs> Tree blood, it just you know, as you do, everybody does. It's great. I, I, I teach at an RPI in Troy, New York, engineering students. Yeah, I've been learning how to teach them, which is to do less and less. And it actually is, it works really well. I'm, I'm like unteaching them in a way. It's like unschooling, but within the context of a university. Don't tell them I said that. <laughs> <laughs> I bet your students can help us write that this, this is not televised, right? <laughs> it's tweeted. Have it before See, I used to answer that question, and that's why I'm not teaching it. <laughs> Okay, so we, we have, I'm coming back to you, but yes, someone way in the back, I think you have your hand up, you've been waiting, but I will come back to you, sir, and you're going to get the last question, but please go ahead. varies. I mean, sometimes it's uh, just a couple of hours. I mean, like in Occupy Wall Street, it's a good example. The action that you see in there is a good example of something that was very spontaneous. And I see Justin right here who was is, is in there. Justin, give a wave. He's one of the people who is like holding pizza boxes and, and marching, you know, saying, get the bull. I mean, that this idea just, just <laughs> happened almost. <laughs> yeah, it's a funny phrase, get the bull. I never even thought of it that way. The summer before Occupy happened, like starting in June, Justin wrote to us a few times, I think, and said, hey, we've got some plans, we're going to occupy Wall Street, and we're like, um, can you stop bothering us? <laughs> <laughs> so it ended up being, uh, you know, very short, but then sometimes we have a long time, and that can be great because it can give you the time to plan, sometimes the time to fundraise. And it can also be a problem because you might spend all your time working on something that you could have done in two hours more effectively. So, um, you know, it can go either way. And, and a lot of it is that we, we, we tend to work fairly, I don't know, spontaneously. But, and then sometimes we do kind of yeah, go down the rabbit hole with an idea that's not very good. <laughs> and we, col we collaborate a lot with organizations that are working already for years and years and years. Um, and, you know, that's actually how we got started working with organizations was somebody from Greenpeace suggested that we do something around the Bhopal catastrophe. <laughs> and they'd been working on that for a long time, of course. Um, that happened in 1984. 
and this was in 2001, and they suggested we try our hand at something around that. Um, and ever since then, we've worked with organizations that work on issues, um, and we just jump in at hopefully an opportune moment. Thank you. Okay, and I did say yes, you get the last word, and then we'll have a couple comments so people can follow up. Please go ahead. So I just wanted to say, like, in, in the film and in some of the questions, there was the idea of, of hopelessness and the cause, but I just wanted to say, like, what you guys do, and I think why most people are here, is that you're hilarious, and that you create such optimism and fun around something that's just so depressing, and just, like, how do you guys see yourself as artists and just creating something beautiful out of something so fun? <laughs> I mean, we're comics, I guess, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, we're using humor to kind of, well, I mean, humor has a bunch of functions, I think. For one thing, it enables us to deal with hopeless, or seemingly hopeless things, because we don't actually know how things get fixed. Like, I think probably at a certain point, desegregation seemed hopeless, or women's rights, or certainly gay marriage, I can speak personally, that's just absurd. Like, I, I with, 10 years ago, wouldn't have crossed my mind for a second. Um, still doesn't, but it's... <laughs> how's that possible? Um, yeah, but it's, um, you know, I, I think humor allows you to kind of just make that leap where you're like, oh yeah, sure, gay marriage. Um, and then um, it also allows you to conscript, like get ideas across to people that won't agree with you normally. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was the whole idea from the beginning, is like, just get funny thoughts across that, that people wouldn't normally get. But if they are laughing, if, if you make a joke and they laugh at the joke, then they have to kind of pay attention to what the joke's about. It's fun. I mean, it's also a reminder that I think that a lot of people who don't identify as activists think activism, that sounds really boring and hard. And It's actually incredibly energizing to do this kind of work. It's an amazing feeling to go out and do an action with other people and be around other people who believe in what you believe and are voices in this larger movement and part of a culture of resistance because I think we all walk around with this feeling of like, it is so messed up every day. And it's really healthy. It's like mentally healthy to just do something that fights back against that. And I, hopefully the film is like encouraging you to do that in whatever way you do it. You know, these guys do it their way, but everybody can do it in whatever way you want to. And maybe it'll be in a kind of comedic action or, you know, you'll choose the way that you do it, but it's meant to just kind of encourage doing anything. trouble, but I see your hand. Ooh. We have to do it quickly, but please go ahead. I wonder if you see that you can convert that have get a part of the folks. Like if they have some of the home security that are actually going back to you and that you know what this actually was not a bad idea stay in touch or you never know. Do you ever convert people or uh, I mean, we've heard from we've we've received email from people who have been audience for these events or got up and done the circle dance and uh, they're enthusiastic the thing is the people we hear from generally aren't be, aren't necessarily converted they just uh, had a really good time and so they reach out to us and say like that you know that was really great I mean the thing is for something like renewable energy even at a defense industry event most of the people there are, are engineers or they're you know really educated business people or even the people in the military aren't climate change deniers. They, 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 they know it's there, they know it's real, and they want to do something about it. And so when given the opportunity, they're leaping at it. So I, you know, but yeah, we, we hear from people occasionally. I don't know about conversions. I'd say more, the more, the, the movies work that way because people see them who, especially young people, we hear from high school students who see the movies, file share them. <laughs> they don't go to theaters. They don't go to theaters. They, they, 
But they, they find, they see it somehow, and then they, they email us and tell us something changed for them. Okay, we have to stop or I'm going to be harmed. We, but we can answer your question. We can, we're here, we can, we're here. We can walk outside and continue yeah. this conversation, but I just want to give you guys a chance. Okay, website, theyesmenarerevolting.com. Yeah. Okay, right. we will work out a tweet outside for those who didn't get that. But also, just please spread the word. IFC Center screenings the rest of this weekend with Q and A's. And if you want to learn to do this particular thing, which is yeah. only one of many things you can do, ActionSwitchboard.net and the incubator that we're launching there, where you can learn, go through an eight-week course. And our, our Twitter, our tweet, our Twitter handle. Like, at the Yes Men is our Twitter handle. And uh, we're actually doing Q&As um, every day this week except the 17th right now with different NGO partners. So we hope that you encourage people to come back to IFC or let your friends know about the other screenings around the country. Yeah. Because this independent film thing is also a social movement, by the way. You know, we can complain about, like, oh, I'm, I feel alienated from mainstream media. So the way to act against that is to support independent film, perhaps like this one, if you want Thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Please stop by the desk outside. And thank you for the Thank you guys.